So uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and also uh, thank you to uh, Jeff and Shriv for the opportunity to uh, fly over the pond uh, for a couple of days and also bring some of my younger colleagues uh, to experience the uh, science that, that's going on here. Uh, this is my uh, view from my office. So Oxford is a place that um, is kind of highly influenced. We specialize in training presidents, prime ministers, theologians, and poets. So you can't, as a scientist, not help be influenced uh, but by this kind of environment. But what I'd like to do, do we, is the pointer, do we have a, is it on the, Ah, okay, got it. Okay, so what, what I'd like to talk about is, is the role that uh, cyclonucleotides might play in the neural control of cardiac excitability and opportunities that might be present for potential therapeutic targeting. And I'm really just going to touch on three key things uh, with my presentation. First of all, briefly just talk about the rationale for the target and where is the best place to do the targeting and what are some of the possibilities and outcomes for this targeting itself. And so uh, there's a lot of work going on at the moment in terms of afferent neuromodulation as, as a potential big target. Uh, there's opportunity in the central nervous system itself with the central integrator. And then, of course, there's big opportunities postganglionically on the efferent side of the uh, control system. And I guess our motivation for wanting to understand this area more, more detail is pretty much based on this question here. That is, what we now know is that virtually all of the primary cardiovascular diseases that you see here are also diseases of the autonomic nervous system. So impaired cardiac vagal function, sympathetic hyperactivity. And if you have this neural phenotype, then this is a very powerful negative prognostic indicator for both morbidity and mortality associated with arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. And this is pretty much the state where we are with the epidemiological-based evidence. But of interest, what we're now starting to see is that it would appear that this neural phenotype actually precedes the overt clinical sign of the disease itself. And I'm going to show you some early pre-disease data uh, which we think may support this particular hypothesis. So this guy stares at me every day in my office, and uh, clearly a genius, but he was more than a genius for discovering the circulation. Uh, he was also a genius for really recognizing the role of the nervous system, long before the autonomic nervous system had even been discovered. And so Harvey had, had written that for every affection of the mind that is attended with either pain or pleasure, hope or fear, is the cause of an agitation whose influence extends to the heart. Now, what foresight the man had before we knew even about the anatomy uh, of, of the nervous system itself. So let's wind forward several centuries now in terms of where we are. And I'd like to show you a little bit of data from our functional neurosurgical program where we think that CNS targeting for the future uh, is a big opportunity therapeutically. So with the advent of improved neuroradiology and imaging, uh, our neurosurgeons can get pinpoint accuracy to very small deep brain structures. And of course, these patients are not presenting for cardiovascular morbidity. They're coming uh, to see us because they have either uh, movement disorders related to Parkinsonian phenotype, or they may have idiopathic uh, pain. So we did some studies, uh, we've been working on this now for 15 years, and what we found in the uh, operating theater is that when you insert your electrodes into the patient, small craniotomy, we can get right down into the basal ganglia, and the basal gland ganglia is a really interesting place in the brain, which is why the movement uh, physicians like to go there, obviously. 
but there's a whole host of circuitry that regulates the cardiovascular system. And I think we have some of the first direct evidence in humans to map these circuits out. So essentially what we've found is that if you target the subthalamic nucleus, but more interestingly, if you target the periactal ductal gray, you can have marked cardiovascular effects. And these are effects that are taking place in awake humans, albeit with an underlying uh, disease. Now these are patients that have been treated for neuropathic pain, uh, usually amputees, single, double amputees. These are young veterans that have come back uh, from Afghanistan and Iraq. And what we found is that if you stimulate the ventral part of the periaqual ductal gray, you can really drive blood pressure down nicely. If you stimulate the dorsal, dorsal lateral electrodes, you can drive blood pressure up. So here is a potential opportunity target for problems with uh, high blood pressure control or indeed orthostatic intolerance. Now clearly when you go to see your physician and you've got high blood pressure, uh, it's, it's a hard ask to say you're going to have a hole drilled in your head and we're going to insert some wiring to control your blood pressure. And although we might snigger at it at the moment, I think watch this space in the next five to ten years because we actually now have the circuits, we've got the technology, and we've got the know-how where to go for the target. So there may be, again, big opportunity in this area for the future. However, uh, in our hands, we think that uh, the area that's much more tractable at the moment is on the post-ganglionic efferent side because it's easy to get to. And I'd just like to make three points here. And the first is that I'm going to show you some data that sympathetic hyper-responsiveness resides at the end organ, a large part of it. And actually, this dys dysregulation can occur before the overt clinical sign of the disease. Both, both post-MI, you can see it very early on, but especially in diseases of high blood pressure that have a genetic basis to them. And finally, if you target the cyclic nucleotides, you can actually rescue this impaired phenotype. And one of the big messenger molecules which helps uh, drive these cyclic nucleotides is clearly the gaseous messenger nitric oxide. And we know that in very high concentrations, uh, it is very deleterious to cellular function. So it can cause DNA deamination and s nitrosylation of key proteins. But in smaller concentrations, more physiological, it targets transcriptional factors, has a very high affinity for heme groups. And of course, its big biological action is to target soluble granulate cyclase to push up the second messenger, cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP has three big downstream effects in cell physiology. It hits protein kinases involved in phosphorylation of ion channels, but it also targets superfamilies of phosphodiesterases, which are involved in the hydrolysis of the two cyclic nucleotides. And finally, it can target HCN channels. And in the heart, this would be uh, HCN4, commonly known as IF. So this is a helicopter view um, where we have been uh, with colleagues over the last few years. And essentially what we find is that NOS isoforms are involved in a very site-specific and differential control in regulating cardiac excitability. And what I mean by that is that NO acts to inhibit sympathetic neurotransmission. And we see this from the paraventricular nucleus from work done in this country right down to the postganglionic sympathetic varicosities inhibiting the release of norepinephrine at the target cells. Conversely, from the nucleus ambiguous or the dorsal motor vagal nucleus, nitric oxide does the opposite. It actually facilitates the release of acetylcholine. And this is also seen postganglionically, and there is complex interaction that's taking place in the intrinsic cardiac ganglia here too. So what I'd like to just show you some data on, and a lot of this data is not published, so I'm rehearsing it in part for the first time, uh, and some of it's at review at the moment. But I'd like to use the enzyme uh, as, as, as an example about the evolution that takes place as you switch from the healthy state to the pre-disease phenotype to the overt clinical disease itself. And it's this switch in here that we're particularly interested in. In the heart itself, there are the heart's full of NOS, as Drew has pointed out, especially in the ganglia around the nerves themselves and also in the cardiac myocytes. 
So we, we've spent a lot of time on uh, sympathetic neurons. These are neurons from the stellate ganglion. I'm not going to talk about the CHAP neurons because I don't have time, but I'll just focus on the TH positive ones. And you can see that these are labeled with EGFP. They make beautiful, beautiful uh, fluorescent uh, networks. And this is the model system that, that we've been building up. Um, so essentially, uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase targets the second messenger, hits downstream kinases to inhibit uh, the movement of calcium coming into the cell. If you modulate intracellular calcium, then you'll affect uh, exocytotic release of the transmitter itself. And this pathway can also be coupled by receptor activation through natriuretic peptides and I'll come on to that in a moment. But one of the key players, we think, in the efficacy of these signaling pathways involves uh, the action of PDE2A. So if you take a uh, stellate ganglion, uh, isolate the neurons now, what we found is that if you depolarize the cells and calcium fluoresce them, what we found in neurons from high blood pressure animals that their calcium transients are much greater than the normal tensor controls. And what surprised us, that these are neurons from animals with established high blood pressure, but we also saw this calcium phenotype in pre-hypertensive SHRs and also in very young neonatal animals. So there was a very early calcium signature that was appear appearing in the start of the phenotype uh, itself. And we want to understand more about this. If you also patch clamp the cells, these are voltage clamp measurements now. And again, this is unpublished work. But what, what we've also found is that the neuronal calcium conductance is much greater in neurons uh, from the SHR compared to the WKY. These are stellates. And these have been recorded in pre-hypertensive animals. So no high blood pressure in the model system yet an early cellular molecular change is taking place in the evolution of the disease itself. And this is the quantitative data over here. If we now do a molecular profile on the tissue, what we've found is that the working hypothesis is that we think pre-programmed in the system there is some metabolic stress that is taking place. Uh, we don't know the exact mechanism at the, the tight molecular end, but what we do see is that the N-NOS protein Activity is done, as is the beta-1 subunit of soluble guanylate cyclase in the SHR neurons, resulting in an overall downregulation in cyclic GMP. But importantly, if we look at levels of tetrahydrobiopterin or total biopterin, they're not different in the disease model. So we don't think there's a substrate limitation or uh, uncoupling that's taking place here. This system is still being able to produce NO. Uh, the catalytic conversion of the amino acid and the molecular oxygen still occurs, but the actual bioavailability of the gaseous messenger is, is, is decreased uh, in, in the system. So armed with that information, we, we asked the question, can we rescue this neuronal phenotype that is seen in these pre-diseased neurons? And the strategy that we developed was uh, a gene transfer viral vector strategy where we uh, constructed uh, in this case, adenoviruses with a noradrenergic specific promoter driving both reported gene M cherry with neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And this is the control vector here with no active transgene present. And if you gene transfer the tissue, what we found is that we can overexpress NNOS, and these are TH positive neurons. You can see in the field there's no viral leakage of the reported gene out of the cell at all. So we're confining our transfer directly to the target cells we want to then go and study. If we now uh, look at the calcium fluorescence, if we depolarize the neurons, you can see with the active transgene now compared to the empty vector that we can slam down the whole calcium conductance. And if we now measure the neurotransmitter directly using tritiated radioactive techniques, in the SHR, we can decrease the amount of neurotransmission. And this is blocked by inhibitors of soluble guanylate cyclase. So it looks like the situation, uh, we can come along here and up-spec this particular pathway here, take down the calcium, affect the exocytotic release of the neurotransmitter, so we get decreased excitation of postsynaptic uh, receptors. 
Now this is a complex model system. The disease does, does, does not lie in the neurons themselves. The disease also lies in the myocytes. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about this downstream pathway because we've published most of the work on this already. But it's just to say that there's a complex interaction taking place uh, neurotransmitter-wise. But a big player we think that is very important now here uh, is the NNOS adapter protein called CAPON. And this is a very interesting protein because it's highly conserved in the nervous system. It encodes the C-terminal uh, of the PDZ domains of NNOS. And in the central nervous system where it was first found, it actually directs NNOS to specific target proteins like synapsin. And of course, importantly in the CNS, uh, if you target polarity complexes, these are very critical for uh, axonal specification and the formation of new synapses. So we were very motivated uh, by this particular study a few years ago from Eduardo Marban's group when he was at Hopkins. Uh, there was a very nice Nature Genetics paper that did a GWAS study pulling out a SNP mutation for patients with long QT syndrome. And this was the only SNP that was significant in the actual GWAS itself. And the Marban group made an adenoviral vector uh, encoding CAPON, and they gene transferred their ventricular myocytes, and when they current clamp their cells, what they found is that if you overexpress the CAPON, you can shorten the action potential duration, implied that you could do something to the QT interval here. And this was reversed by a non-specific NOS inhibitor. And they thought it worked by the NO inhibiting ICAL and activating the delayed rectifier potassium current IKR. So armed with that observation, we asked the question, is there any evidence for CAPON to be present in the autonomic nervous system? Because no one's ever looked for it there. Is CAPON present in TH positive neurons and CHAP positive neurons? And if it is there, what is it doing? So in answer to the first question, uh, there's bucket loads of it there. We were quite surprised. Uh, in both TH and CHAP positive neurons, we see a lot of CAPON. This is the co-localization here with the bright field. And of interest, when we looked at the expression in the disease neurons, we found that there was significantly less CAPON present in the SHR compared to the WKY. And we then asked the question, is this dysregulation of this adapter protein somehow linked to the calcium phenotype that is seen in the neurons, that is, the enhanced uh, calcium current that is present and also the enhanced calcium transient, which are directly coupled to the secular release of the neurotransmitter. So we attacked this problem by re-engineering our viral vectors. And this time, we made a viral vector with a noradrenergic-specific promoter driving M. cherry, and this time CAPON. We can load the virus into the neuron, no leakage. We can overexpress it. These are the Western blots here. And we get big upregulation of CAPON. And we actually stabilize NNOS itself. And even though the NNOS protein didn't change, what we found is that the NOS activity was up and it was blocked by an NNOS inhibitor, AAAN, and we could also drive the expression of cyclic GMP. So the take-home message, if you do this, what we found is that we could wind down the uh, total neuronal calcium current when we voltage clamp the cells in both the WKY neurons and also in the SHR neurons here. In addition to turning down the inward calcium current, we also targeted the intracellular calcium transient. And what we found compared to the empty virus, you can see here that we can certainly attenuate the intracellular calcium transient in these neurons. And pharmacologically, when we apply AAAN, the NOS inhibitor, we get partial reversal. And this is the quantitative data below. Uh, the key data to probably look at is the red. This is the SHR neuron treated with the empty vector. And this is the response of active gene transfer here. If you follow this all the way through now, so this is in vivo gene therapy transferred into the rat, where we've now targeted uh, the ganglia, in particular the sympathetic ones, because this is a noradrenergic specific coupled virus. It's not going anywhere else. And if we gene transfer the animals, we can overexpress the CAPON compared to the empty vector. And critically, when we look at the in vitro assay for norepinephrine release, we can markedly decrease the neurotransmission itself, and we can reverse this with the NOS inhibitors. 
So in addition to big things happening down here with uh, cap on dysregulation and long QT, we believe that if you superimpose the neuron on top of this, and it's highly conceivable that with the mutations in the patients themselves, that the mutation would also be present in the neurons in addition to being in the myocytes. So you can imagine a situation now that if you're dumping more neurotransmitter onto a cardiac cell that's got very long action potential durations, you're going to create a perfect storm for the heart in terms of abnormal calcium cycling and oscillation, which will certainly facilitate uh, after depolarizations. And I guess this is the situation of someone sitting with a bad snip of cap on running for the plane that you're about to miss as you crank up this guy and bang, off you go. Not on the aeroplane. So um, just to kind of wind up, I'd like to show some very recent data which we're still thinking hard about. And this is pretty much based on targeting this system again, but this time through receptor coupled pathways. So natritic peptides bind to receptors here to activate particulate guanylate cyclase to work through this neuronal inhibition. So BMP in particular was a big favorite clinically uh, a few years back. Uh, uh, for treating heart failure. So IV neceratide uh, had a bad press uh, a year or so ago when the clinical trials came around and pulled the plug, basically saying that the patients did worse on the neceratide when they got it IV uh, over the control uh, data. And this was a big, huge disappointment, I think, probably for many people in uh, clinical practice. And because Physiologically, natritic peptides do all the good things for you. And why, why did it fail? So we had a look at this, and we just wanted to look at the issue that some literature was suggesting that the neceratide may actually have been pro-sympathetic, driving a bad phenotype. When we look at healthy neurons and we apply BNP, we can turn down calcium currents, wash it off over several different concentrations, we can take down the intracellular calcium transient. We can get a decrease in neurotransmission. This is all good stuff. Uh, when we go in vitro for looking at sympathetic activation directly, this is decentralized preps, uh, you get a nice attenuation to the sympathetic activation. All really good stuff. So why, why doesn't it work in the disease state? And we think the reason it doesn't work in the disease state is that what the disease is doing, whether it's heart failure or high blood pressure, is that you're getting a marked upregulation of this phosphodiesterase. We know in the human literature and heart failure that PD2A levels are very, very high. We have now also seen in our genetic-based high blood pressure model the, the same observation. <clears throat> So if the PD2 is really high, what it's doing is smashing up the cyclic GMP. So the cyclic GMP is not being able to work on downstream inhibition for calcium entry. So when you come along with your peptide, or indeed your NO, you're not being able to get the positive efficacy of the cyclic GMP. So what, what's the evidence for this? So what we've done is, could we take normal cells and mimic the disease phenotype? So we made another viral vector overexpressing PDE2A. And I think this is really interesting. What we found is that we could overexpress the PDE2A. And when we gave it to the neurons with the BNP and measured cyclic GMP, you can see there's no way we can drive the cyclic GMP up if the PDE2A is high. If you use the empty vector with no PDE2, so just normal expression of PDE2, now the BNP comes through and hits the cyclic GNP. So we think the PD2A is a break in the system affecting the efficacy of uh, the downstream cyclic nucleotide. And you can track this all the way through. So the calcium transients are big here, and also we can drive more neurotransmission in the system. So when we apply the strategy to the disease model, what happens? So in the normal tissue, when we put the BNP on, we can see the nice decrease in the calcium currents. In disease tissue, we just can't budge the calcium transients or the calcium currents at all when uh, we put the BNP on. 
The only way we can get attenuation of the calcium current and the calcium transient is if we block the activity of PD2A with a Bay compound. And more recently, we've developed a dominant negative for PD2A, where we can now rescue the uh, iron channel phenotype directly. So we're left with this question here. If we want to clinically revisit a drug like BNP therapeutically, maybe the strategy we've got to think about is what I would call double therapy strategy. That is, in order for the BMP to have all its positive effects in the patient with heart failure, what we probably have to do is, in a very site-specific fashion, target PD2A in these TH-positive neurons so you can allow the uh, modulation of intracellular calcium and then turn down the gain of the sympathetic neurotransmission on the postsynaptic site. So in many ways, the BMP is behaving like a smart beta blocker, but it's working presynaptically. Uh, to the receptor itself. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, uh, my team in Oxford, a group of talented young uh, graduate students, postdocs, and physician scientists, and in particularly, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, some of the people that did the work that I've just presented. Uh, Dr. Dan Lee did the work on BMP with uh, Kevin Liu, who's a graduate student. The cap on work was done by Dr. CJ Liu, who passed as thesis examination yesterday, um, also with uh, Dr. Ho, and uh, Dr. Herring was involved in some of the autonomic responses for BNP, and uh, Dr. Natalia Nefrova, uh, was a very talented virologist, made the viral constructs, and Lavinia Woodward, an undergraduate medical student, spied the observation of the PD2A uh, regulation. Uh, I think my key point here, it's really important to surround yourself with bright, people brighter than yourself and young people uh, in the lab because they can help drive uh, the science hard at you. <clears throat> and of course, without our funding partners, uh, I would have nothing to say to you today, so thank you. <clears throat>